always an honor to speak and share the word of God. This morning, I want to acknowledge our guests. Our, my son-in-law and daughter-in-law are here, Garth and Cindy Peck, and then a row of neighbors from where we lived in Rancho Mirage a couple of years, a couple of years back. Welcome. Thank you to be here. I would call your names, but I might forget somebody, and then I'd be embarrassed. So thank you for coming. I think Donna and I started visiting here, vacationing here, oh, early 1980s. In the winter in Madison, Wisconsin, snow is blowing, maybe zero, and we fly out here and land and see the palm trees and the mountains and think, this is heaven, <laughs> or at least paradise. So we've come year after year, and now we live out here, and it's been a delight. So thank you for coming, and thank you, special friends, for coming. I want to share two uh, little verses before we get into the message. They would be my text. In Proverbs chapter 19, verse 22, but what is desirable in a man is his kindness. What is desirable in a man is kindness. That's the Old Testament and the New Testament, Ephesians 4, 32. Be kind to one another. Just simple little phrase, but not so simple to do, to obey. That's, that's different. There were two farmers. They lived together, I mean, close together, their farms. And one farmer raised grain and big dogs. The other farmer was a sheep farmer, and he had a lot of, land, a lot of sheep. And it was at the time when the sheep, the ewes were about to give birth to the little lambs. There was a problem because these big dogs next door would chase his sheep. And as they were about to birth uh, little lambs, it was a very probable, dangerous time. So this farmer didn't know what to do. He thought, I've got a gun, I can shoot those dogs. I can get poison, I can poison those dogs. I can call the, the sheriff and put a lawsuit against this guy. But he, but he thought, God, what would you have me do? And the first ewes gave birth to a couple of little lambs and he had an idea. He got two baby bottles, got milk in the bottles, took these little lambs, took them over to the neighbor who had two little kids. And he gave them these little lambs and told them how to, show them how to uh, feed the bottle of milk to these little lambs. And these little kids were absolutely ecstatic. They were so happy. They were so excited. <clears throat> they hugged them, they held them. And now this farmer had a problem because his big dogs chased the little lambs that his kids were loving. He took care of the dogs. No more chasing. Kindness won. Now, I can't say that kindness will always win, but most times, many times, oftentimes, when we are kind, we win in whatever thing is going on. Because whatever we sow, that's what we reap. If we sow kindness, we will reap kindness. Throughout my life, as you, you meet different kind of people, different kinds of people, all kinds of people. We've met people that were just so smart, so intelligent. We've met people that were creative geniuses. We have met people that were talented musically. We have met people that were outstanding in the, in the ministry world of, of knowing theology and knowing the Bible. We met people that were handsome and people that were beautiful. And we've met people that were ornery and mean and ugly. <laughs> Maybe you have too. All kinds of people. But the people that have marked my life are the people that were kind. Simple. People that were kind, that were kind to me, that were kind to my family. Kind. It says, be kind to one another. And what is desirable of a man is his kindness. Now, that really goes along with the Sermon on the Mount. It's, re it's uh, recorded in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, but also a part of it in Luke chapter 6. Let me read this. But I say to you, who here love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. Whoever hits you on the cheek, offer your other cheek. <laughs> it hit you there. Give to everyone who asks of you. And whoever takes away what you have, 
Don't demand it back. Treat others the same way you want to be treated. If you love those who love you, what credit is that? And it goes on more and more about being kind. Being kind. Can you recall someone that touched your life just out of simple kindness? And my brother-in-law sitting here way back in the 1960s when we started pastoring, I think our salary was $35 a week. And I know everything is relative to the time, but that wasn't enough to live, not to buy groceries. And my brother-in-law, Garth Peck Jr., was in the Navy. And he started sending us his tithe. Now, I know in the Navy back then, he probably got 4000 a month. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> Maybe $40 a month. But he sent us our kind, his tithe. I decided right then he was my favorite brother-in-law. <laughs> and still is. Be kind. Be kind. Who is it then that God wants us to be kind to? We could just make one blank statement to everybody. The story in Luke 10 of the Good Samaritan, the, the Samaritan and the Jews didn't get along. They were fighting and quarreling all the time. And this guy is heading from Jerusalem down to Jericho, which was a foolish thing to do. It was known for robbers. And he was attacked. He was beaten. He was left for dead. Everything he had was stolen. Along came a Jewish priest and went, <coughs> just walked on by. Along came a Levite, a religious leader, and went, <coughs> just walked on by. And along came a Samaritan who, like I said, there was animosity between the Samaritans and the Jews. So the Samaritan goes over to the Jew, bathes him, puts salve on him, carries him to the first holiday in, uh, inn, pays for his stay, and says, and I will come back, and if he, if, you, if he owes any more, I'll take care of that. Total stranger. That's all encompassing. That's, that's staggering. Who should I be kind to? Well, basically everybody. But you know, I have found that sometimes the hardest ones to be kind to are our family, our family members. Sometimes it's hard for me, if you could believe that, to be kind to Donna. <laughs> Many people end up getting divorced and later regret their divorce because it was a mistake. Kindness could probably have settled the issues. Just being kind to one another. Four little words. Be kind to one another. Be kind to one another. Who do I need to be kind to? My kids, my, my parents, <clears throat> my neighbors. Now, it's easy to be kind to your neighbor until they borrow one of your expensive tools and break it and deny it. It's easy to be kind to your neighbors until they just are so mean and ugly. It's easy to be kind to people when they're kind to you. But it's not so easy to be kind to people when they're not kind to us. Jesus is our perfect example of being kind. We even need to be kind in California traffic <laughs> when we're cut off and so on and so forth. <clears throat> in our Desert Sun paper a couple weeks ago, there was an article about Sesame Street. Sesame Street people that produce it were doing a study, and they said they came up with the fact, duh, people are not kind to each other nowadays. Isn't that a revelation? We need to teach and model for children on Sesame Street how to be kind. We live in a day, we live in a time when people aren't usually kind to each other. And it creates all kinds of problems. So I hope God blesses Sesame Street and they do it right. And they impact our little children growing up about being kind. Today they tell us that we're having a escalating problem in the military, suicides. Terrible, terrible. 15 suicides a day are committed in the military. 15 a day. Now, what we probably don't read about much, there are a lot of suicides among the clergy, among pastors. It doesn't usually report it as a suicide. It's just, you know, they died of an accident. Tragic. 
Um, what are we going to do about that? Suicide kills more people than cancer <clears throat> or HIV AIDS in the ages of 15 through 44 than in war. Suicides, terrible thing, terrible thing, suicides. But kindness, I believe, could take care of so much of that. Being kind to one another, being kind to one another. I'm losing my statistics here, here they are. Kindness in the ministry, in the church, towards pastors, and since your pastors are not here, I, it's a good time for me to tell you, think about it and be extra kind to your pastoral staff. 80% of pastors are discouraged to the point of quitting the ministry. 40% of pastors would leave the ministry if they had another way of supporting their family. 50% 50, 50 of pastors say they're unable to meet the demands of their job, and they'd, they'd like to quit. For every 20 pastors that begin in ministry, for every 20, only one will spend his life in ministry and retire, and retire, having been a pastor. 45% of pastors say they have experienced depression and burnout and are ready to quit. Schaefer Institute interviewed, interviewed 1,050 pastors, and every one of them, 100%, said they had close associates or friends from seminary <clears throat> who had left the ministry. They'd given up burnout and conflict. Now, I know, I know, I know none of that ever would happen at <laughs> Victory Christian Center. No conflict, no problems, right? Since Don and I were married 58 years ago, we've been ministering together all these years. We've almost seen it all when it comes to church life. Let me challenge you to be kind to your pastor. Maybe once a month, send him an email and compliment his sermon. Maybe drop him a card. And certainly, when you're in church, thank him. He's one of the greatest expositors of the Bible that I know. Most of us didn't choose to go into the ministry to get rich <laughs> or to be famous. But a little word of encouragement is almost like getting a raise, almost a kind word. Now, if <clears throat> someone preaches a lousy, lousy sermon, don't lie and say, oh, that was a wonderful sermon. But find something, oh, I liked your shirt. <laughs> say something that, that is nice. A nice word absolutely can make it for any of us. A thoughtful compliment. Now, <clears throat> all these decades of being in the ministry, we have seen a lot. Kind of like the ad for farmers uh, insurance. We've seen a lot. The last 10 years, now I'm no longer the, the uh, coordinator for the Fellowship of Christian Assemblies, but for 10 years, my privilege to travel coast to coast, Canada, and do mission trips and so on. <clears throat> and it was interesting to me. <clears throat> I'm scheduled to speak at a church. I always like to arrive a little bit early. I think we were here 15 minutes early this morning. You were just getting out of bed, I guess. Anyway, we <clears throat> I'd go to a church. I'd go in, I'd sit down. It's obviously I'm, I'm the guest speaker. Now, one person would come up and say, oh, you must be the guest speaker. My name is Joe Blow. What's your name? So glad that you're here. Not one. Ten years. Then during the service, <clears throat> After singing in worship, I'm introduced. <clears throat> I get up to speak, and it's stone faces. Everybody carved out of granite. Not a smile, not an amen, not a nod, not a mm-hmm, not a thank you, not a. Now, I'm old, and I don't care, really. My time has come and gone. But I think of other guest speakers that come. And when I pronounce the benediction, people leave like the church is on fire. Got to get out of here. Not a thank you. You got a nice shirt. <laughs> or something about your text or something about you said, you said from the word of God touched my heart. Nothing. It's no wonder pastors give up. If they were knocking down humongous salaries, they'd probably say, who cares? Just a little kindness. Just a little kindness. Donna says, kindness is like God coming down in flesh and blood. Kindness, being kind. Donna quotes this little thing. 
a, a little girl was praying. The little girl said, God, make all the bad people good and make all the good people nice. <laughs> Not all good people are nice. A lot of times we don't think. We just don't think. We, we're in a hurry. We don't take time. We need to begin to think. We need to begin to put up our antenna. We need to be proactive in areas where we can be kind. Oh, you are a man. God bless oh, you. Kind. May you reward her. May your reward in heaven be great. I like to say, oh, no, I don't take water because I don't water down my sermons. <laughs> but I am having fun, a little fun scratchy throat <clears> talking. Um, be kind. See, it is so blooming simple. We can forget to activate our kindness. We need to be kind to our kids. Our, our oldest daughter, she is 56, and then our next daughter is 54, and our son is 51 or something. Would they say, Dad was kind? Oh, we believe in discipline. We have rules, and there's, there's consequences when we break the rules growing up but, but nonetheless, dad was kind. I know they could say that about their mother, but could they say that about their dad? Dad was kind. Don't overlook the simplicity of this message, how profound it really is. <clears throat> to be kind, to be kind. So, be kind to your pastor. He's a good pastor. Pastor, your staff, Mitch included. Be kind, be kind. Be kind. A soft answer turns away wrath. A word of kindness can change a whole life. We travel among our churches wherever in the Midwest in um, the spring of 1960 when I finished Bible college and through to the fall. We accepted a pastor in western Nebraska, Minden, Nebraska. And uh, when, we, when we were there, Renee had just been born. So she was just a little, <coughs> excuse me, little baby. And I noticed next door to us, the neighbor, our, our driveways were side by side, and I had seen him from a distance. He was a huge man. I found out he drove caterpillars and turnipoles and road moving equipment and was a construction man building roads. And this guy had shoulders on him like an NFL lineman. He didn't have a neck. <laughs> his head just sat on his big shoulders and big arms and hands, and, and his face always looked kind of sunburned because he was out in the sun all the time. So it was dark brown burned. We walked out one day from our house and he happened to be in his yard and he said, hey, come over here. And now he's just a good old boy. A good old boy, you know, <laughs> drank and swore and carried on. Just a good old boy. He wasn't a church guy. And I thought, oh boy, how's this going to go? Now, I won't dare say what he said, but as we're getting closer to him, he's reaching out his arms for our baby and he is swearing a blue streak. You son of a little blah, blah, blah angel, aren't you blah, 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 blah cute? And his wife comes running out, Ed, don't swear at the baby. I ain't blankety blank blank swearing at the baby. But look at her, <laughs> ain't she cute? <clears throat> Held our little baby at arm's length, huge arms. He said, oh, and he's swearing again. Oh, you're such an angel. He takes our baby, rubs his cheek against her cheek puts our baby against his chest, still swear a blue streak in compliments of our baby. That guy marked my life by kindness. Big, gruff guy, but he was kind. He touched my life, our lives, because he was kind. I keep coming back to these words. What is it that God desires in a man? It's kindness, <clears throat> kindness, not being handsome, being successful, being rich, being intellectual, on and on. <clears throat> Those things are good. But God desires kindness in a man and women too. So what is a man? I was looking it up. What is a man? In the USA, <clears throat> the average man is 5 foot 10. The average man <clears throat> is 38 inch chest, 40 some inch waist, and a nuisance around the house. The average man. <laughs> What is a man? Well, we're not talking here about <clears throat> strength physically. We're talking about a man, <clears throat> I believe, as God sees a man. A man who has integrity. 
24-7. A man who has biblical morality. A man who loves God, loves his family, loves his kids, loves his church. A straight shooter, a man. What's desirable in this man is his kindness. His kindness. The prophet Micah said like this, What does the Lord require but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly? That's pretty simple. What does the Lord, what does the Lord require? Right there in the middle, to love kindness. Zechariah, the prophet, said, Practice kindness. Practice kindness. Well, you just have to be alert and be thinking and, and watch for opportunities to be kind. I'm busy. I'm, a, I'm in a hurry. I got things to do. And I can just overlook all kinds of opportunities to be kind. Donna was in the grocery store and uh, she was checking out at the, the counter. And another, a lady was there with her child. And the child kept pushing her cart against Donna's heels. Ow! Donna was. A moment later, <clears throat> that cart up against her, her heels over and over. And she was ready to tell that woman off, but she didn't. So then she was checked out and got her stuff together and was going out to the parking lot. And there was that woman loading her car with her groceries. She said, I had this awful urge to take my cart and just run it into her new car. <laughs> take that, you idiot. Now, that, she would never say that. And she never did that. Don't you know, Sunday morning, here sat that lady <laughs> right, right there. She was so glad she hadn't been mean or ornery, <laughs> but she had just let it go. I've been there. I've done that kind of thing more than once. <clears throat> now, in the Old Testament, where it says uh, God requires kindness, the Hebrew word is very, very complicated. Chesed or chesed or chesed. It means be kind. Isn't that complicated? And in the New Testament, Ephesians 4, <clears throat> 32, be kind to one another. The Greek word, <clears throat> again, is very, very complicated. You read all of what it means, it says, be kind. We can understand that. My question is, do I do that? Do I consciously, do I consciously take the action of being kind? <clears throat> it happens in our families. Years back, many years back, decades back, one of my sisters, I don't know how, got on the outs for Donna and I. And she wrote us scathing letters. It's a wonder they didn't burn up before they got to our mailbox. And uh, I would write back and, and say, <clears throat> I apologize for everything I did. I know I was your older brother, and sometimes we double dated. And I would tell you, you're just acting like an idiot. Don't do those things. Don't say those things. And I'm sure I was a typical brother. I was sometimes ornery to you. Forgive me. Forgive me for everything I did. Forgive me. <clears throat> she wrote us off. Years went by. We just let it go. Something changed. And now we're close. God, God can work those things out. And I'm glad, I'm glad that he did. When we were uh, in pastoring way up in northwestern Minnesota, in the early 60s, we came to a church. We didn't realize there were two factions. They were fighting with each other. And most of them were related, brothers against brothers. And they were unhappy with the church. And so they became unhappy with us. And so they started having secret meetings to get enough votes to vote us out so we would no longer be the pastor. They couldn't get rid of the people they didn't like. So they thought, we'll get rid of the pastor. It was turbulent. It was, it was trying. It was awful. I, I, was, I was just going through all kinds of problems over this. And as I prayed and prayed and prayed, God seemed to direct me like to the Luke 6 that we just read, Sermon on the Mount. Turn the other cheek, go the second mile, pray for those that hate you, pray for those, just be kind. Be kind. Now, you can, you can decide, you can analyze this however you want, but three ringleaders, three families, the one family, a tornado came through and just wiped out their farm. Another family, husband and wife and quite a few children, it just started to disintegrate. So many problems. Third family, older people, a favorite uh, grandson, they were in a hunting, he was in a hunting axe out on a boat hunting ducks and his gun went off and killed him. Boom to boom to boom. Now, was it just coincidental? I don't know. 
Ask Pastor Scott Rude, he'll know. <laughs> I don't know. But when we're kind, God knows how to take care of things, believe me. When we, by his grace, practice kindness. Well, we have six grandchildren. Only one is a, a granddaughter. The others are guys. So now she is, they have blessed us with, with grand, great-grandkids. And their oldest is Gabe, Gabriel. He's five now, and their little girl, Tallulah, is two or three. Well, a couple years back, when, when Gabriel was just learning to talk and so on and so forth, he was getting to be a little ornery. Gabriel, pick up your toys. No, I'm not going to. Gabriel, time to go to bed. I don't want to go to bed. Gabriel, come to the table. We're going to eat now. No. So Abby sat him down. They started talking to him and said, listen, we need to learn to be courteous. We need to learn to say, no, thank you. She said, I have taught a little monster. Now I say, Gabe, time to go to bed. No, thank you. <laughs> Gabe, time to pick up your toys. No, thank you, Mommy. No, thank you. <laughs> so kind of backfired for her. Kindness is not being weak or foolish or stupid or ignorant. <clears throat> it takes a man and a woman, it takes a man to be kind. It shows his inner strength, his trust in God. I think one of America's earliest millionaires was John D. Rockefeller, and I read what he wrote about leadership. He said, I can hire people to be my CEO, my VP, my managers, my this, my that, and I can teach them how to run my business. What I can't teach them is how to be kind in relationships because the die seems to be cast the concrete seems to be set. When you're middle 20s to 30, if you're ornery and mean, you're going to die ornery and mean. And we know God can change that. But he said the hardest thing is to find people that know how to be nice to people. Well, as Christians, we ought to be the ones that set the, set the bar. We ought to be the ones that demonstrate and show kindness. Kindness is an amazing thing. We were in Madison those 34 years. North about 50, 60 miles was Fond du Lac. Another 50, 60 miles was Green Bay. They're famous for something. I don't know whether it was Green Bay or something or other with a pigskin. And the pastor in Fond du Lac, we were good friends. We were close to the same age. And he told me this story. He said, one wintry day with ice and snow and uh, wind, uh, one of the couples from our church was at the grocery store, had their bags of groceries, were heading to their car, and they saw this elderly man, now I are one, this elderly man and woman struggling in the ice and the wind to get to their car with their bags of groceries. They run o ran over and grabbed them by the arm, man and woman, and helped them to their car and opened the door and got them inside and put their groceries in the back seat. And, and the elderly man looked up and said, why did you help us? And the young couple said, well, we're Christians and we ought to be helpful and kind. Said, wow, wow never seen anything like this. Well, what church did you go to? And they told him, oh, I left, that was it. Two weeks later, Pastor Bakken got a letter, didn't recognize the return address, who, who are these people? Open it up, you must be doing something right. This young couple from your church, blah, 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 this is what they did. And in it was a little check for $100,000. You know what the moral of the story is? Help old people to the car. We don't have any ice and snow, but we do have wind <laughs> and sand. So when you go to the grocery store, look around, look around. Same pastor, one of the most conservative pastors that I've ever known in all my life, very conservative. I think they have five children, and they're grown up now and married, and the son came to his dad and said, Dad, I, I just ordered a Harley Davidson motorcycle. And back a few years, you had to order it. And maybe you'd come in in a year or two. They were unable to keep up in the production. And he said, Dad, we just found out we're going to have a baby. There's no way we can get that motorcycle and financially take care of having a baby. But Dad, if you buy this cycle, you can't sell it right away because that's kind of like black market. I think you have to keep it a year, maybe two years. Then you can sell it. You will still make money. They're so hard to get hold of. Well, Pastor Bakken thought it over and bought the cycle. Well, the little 
elderly ladies in the church didn't think too much of him tooting around on his Harley. But he drove it. One day, a sweet little elderly lady came to him and looked up and said, Pastor, would you do my grandson's funeral? He said, sure. Pastor, he never came to this church. That's okay. Pastor, he never went to any church. Okay. Pastor, he lived a wild life. Okay, I'll do your funeral. Pastor didn't realize this guy did live a wild life. He had, as we say, a million friends. He was the life of the party, but he'd been killed in a car accident. Nor did the pastor know, knew, he didn't know that <clears throat> this guy drove an 18-wheeler from coast to coast. That was his work. And they all loved him, all the drivers, because he was so much fun. The day the funeral come, came, and pastor is driving his car to the church, and he sees bumper to bumper, 18 wheelers parked for blocks. Ooh. He goes into the parking lot. It's full of these rough looking Harley motorcycles and got drivers in all their leathers, long hair, you know, tattoos, piercings, and everything. Ooh. He didn't know if they were Hell's Angels or Heaven's Angels, but they don't think he was a Heaven Angel. So <clears throat> he gets out of his car and grabs his Bible and walks out looking for the meanest, orniest, roughest, toughest guy, figuring he's probably the leader. So he walked over him, looked at his bike, started complimenting his bike. Oh, you got a lot of chrome on this bike. You know, I think. <clears throat> Finally, this guy said, well, what do you know about motorcycles, Rev? He said, I have a Harley. And the guy goes, hey, gang, the preacher has a hog. <laughs> Funeral started, got to the point of preaching, Pastor Martin gets up to preach, and every time he said something or whatever, all these Harley guys would go, yeah, Rev! <laughs> yeah, Rev! A little kindness might even change the heart of the Hells Angels. I don't know. I haven't tried it. A little kindness. A little kindness. You know, it doesn't cost usually anything to be kind. To say a nice word. To pat somebody on the back. To give them a compliment. A kind act really usually doesn't cost us anything and the Bible says we will reap what we sow we will reap what we sow and it's not hard to be kind until that neighbor takes your brand new tool and breaks it it's not kind I mean it's not hard to be kind till one of your own family members lies about you it's not hard to be kind if someone really treats your kids bad. Ooh, that makes you. It's not hard to be kind until we face something that's not so easy. And we need the grace of God in our hearts then to be kind. It's not hard to be kind until somebody in church insults us, lies about us, gossips about us in church. Oh, yeah, been there 58 years. Happens. And we have several choices. The best is to be kind and practice what we read in Luke chapter 6. To be kind in marriage when we've had an argument. Whichever our spouse needs kindness the most when they probably deserve it the least. To be kind when we want to be mean and lash out against them. To be kind to smile, to say thank you. Oh, it changes the world. It changes everything when we're kind. Like the little girl prayed, God, make all the bad people good and all the good people nice. <laughs> <clears throat> now, I'm going to almost read this because I don't want to mess it up, and it just chokes me up often when I read it. One day when I was a freshman in high school, I saw a kid from my class walking home from school. His name was Kyle looked to me like he was carrying all of his books. I thought to myself, why would anyone bring all of his books home on Friday night? He must really be a nerd. I had quite a weekend planned myself. Parties, some football, my buddies come over, watch TV. So I shrugged my shoulders and kept on walking. A little bit, I noticed a bunch of the guys from high school run up behind him, knock him flat, his glasses went flying 10 feet away in the grass, and all his books were scattered every way. 
I jogged over to where he was, and the look in his eyes was terrible sadness. My heart went out to him, and so I helped him pick up his books. I found his glasses. I gave them to him, and I said, those guys are just jerks. They need to get a life. He looked at me and said, hey, thanks. And on his face was a smile of gratitude I would never forget. Well, we started walking together, and I found out he lived a couple of houses from where I lived. And I said, how come I haven't ever seen you before? Well, I always went to a private school. This is my first couple of days here at the public school. And I'm getting bullied and taunted and teased and made fun of. And it's just too much. Well, I said, do you want to hang out with, with me and my friends this weekend? He said, well, yeah. So he said, I got to know Kyle. And he was really a pretty cool kid. So we played football. We played video games. We watched TV. And, and it developed into a great friendship. Next morning, I helped carry half his books back to the school and to his locker. And all of a sudden, years are slipping by. And we're the sophomore, and then we're junior. And Kyle filled out to be some dude. And I was jealous because he got far more dates than I did. The girls really liked him. He was something else. And all of a sudden, it's senior year. We're graduating. And I was going to go to Duke on a football scholarship. And he was going to go to Georgetown. He wanted to become a doctor. Wow. I knew we would be friends forever. We, have, we had gotten so close. Graduation day, he was to give the address as the valedictorian. He was nervous. And, and I walked up to him and pounded him on the back and said, you'll do good. You'll do good. <clears throat> it was time for him to speak. And he got up and he said, this is a time to thank your teachers your parents, and people that have helped you come this far to finish high school. But most of all, I want to thank my friend. I was walking home to commit suicide. I took all my stuff out of the locker because I didn't want my mom to have to come and take it. And you stepped into my life and showed me kindness. We never know what a word of kindness will do or mean or how it will change somebody's life. Kindness, kindness, kindness. Today, we can demonstrate kindness in so many ways. But often, I think we need the power of God. We need Jesus Christ in our lives to help us because it's not always our nature to be kind. And the Bible says if we are in Christ, we become a new creation. Old things pass away, all things become new. And I, I personally need to pray. I need to really pray every day, God, help me to be kind. Lord, I've asked you to be my Savior. I've asked you to live in my heart. But sometimes I can be neglectful. I can be unobservant. I can be just busy about my own little busy life and not see opportunities where I could be kind and show the love of God that's in my heart. Kindness will often dissolve anger. Kindness will often deflate criticism. Kindness will often disarm revenge. Kindness will often diffuse disagreement. Kindness will often deactivate jealousy just by being kind. I would just say in closing, because I've shared with you about being kind, you'll probably be tested today or tomorrow or this week with an opportunity do you ignore it, or are you kind? Do you walk away from it, or do you say that nice word, or help someone and show forth kindness? So for me, it's a prayer I need day by day. Forgive me, Lord, of my sin and of not being kind. Forgive me, and forgive the other guy who's not kind to me, but help me have the power to be kind to them, even if they don't deserve it. Our world could change if there was a little bit, a little bit more kindness from the grassroots level all the way up to nation to nation to be kind. Would you stand? I'll close in prayer. Be kind. I often say, <clears throat> if I preach shorter than your pastor, maybe I'll get invited back. <laughs> 
Lord, there's no joke about it. This world is pretty short on kindness. Help us to raise the bar. Help us to show an example of being kind. Help us to reach out to others, whether they're a total stranger or someone we really know well or someone in our family. Help us, old-fashioned, be kind. Help us, empower us, strengthen us, help us to be alert and be kind. We pray, we pray, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't know if I turn this to Mitch or...